Hello and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 48. I'm Charlie Place and joining me today is a writer of contemporary fiction with added mystery who sets her novels on the south coast of England. I've got an interest here. Her debut novel, The Theatre of Dreams, has been relaunched this month. Hello, Rosie Travers. Hello, Charlie. So, as writers often do, you've always been interested in writing. But you got into it more seriously during your time in California and I think again in the Netherlands. Can you tell us about your publication journey? Yes, I obviously as a teenager, or as a child, I used to scribble stories. As a teenager, I fancied uh, writing teenage magazine stories and I tried to do that for a little while. But it wasn't really until I went to California with my husband when I was in my 40s that I actually found the time to take up writing seriously. It started as a blog about expat life, which I had plenty of time on my hands because my daughter was at school all day, husband was out at work, and it was just a a way of filling my time, but also telling friends back home what I was up to. Now, I was in the US from 2009 to 2012. When I came back to the UK, I took a creative writing course part-time at Eastleigh College. Then we moved to the Netherlands, so I had another few years on my own penning another blog, but also concentrating on trying to write a novel using all the things that I'd learned during my my time on the course. So this is interesting. Obviously, California it sounds very exotic here in Britain. And I mean, the Netherlands is nice enough as well, but you've decided to set your books on the South Coast. Yes, bizarre. I know. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, that, all that scenery, all that inspiration. I think probably despite spending time living in another country, the south coast of England is what I know best. Mm. It may be there's a book about California in me. I always intended to write up my blog, The Adventures That I'd Had With The Expat Wife. There is a book on the back burner called The Expat Wives Club. Whether that will ever see the light of day, I don't know. I could be sued by several people. <laughs> um, the Netherlands, yeah, again, a lovely place to live. Uh, the scenery is not particularly dramatic to be honest with you not particularly inspiring but you never know but no it's the south coast is where my heart is it's where we came back to after living abroad and where I grew up Hmm. yeah my description could sound disparaging about south coast but I live here as well so you know it's nice to read your books and things like that so the theatre of dreams was first published in 2018 I remember going to your launch it was great and you've decided to relaunch it why is this Well, I had a very short contract with my publisher. My indie publisher did tell me when I signed the contract, they would only give me a a two year contract for the book, which at the time seemed fine. I thought, yeah, okay, I can do that. Then it won't tie me down to to anything long term. But actually, two years flew by very quickly. And by the time the book came out, it was almost at the end of its contract. It took so long for the publisher to actually get it out there. So it was actually only available on Amazon available to buy for less than 15 months so I didn't really get much chance to didn't really get established and then I had quite a a, lost a little bit of heart in my writing and I had a bit of a break and it's only since I've come back with a new book which I published self-published this summer that I really wanted to give the the theatre dreams another go give it another chance because it's been sat in the background not doing anything and um, I just thought it's a really lovely story and I think it deserves another chance so I'm self-publishing it and I've arranged to have a new cover a lovely cover designer that worked on my my latest cozy mystery which this is the book I've just released she did me a cover for the theatre of dreams which I loved and I feel it might appeal to a a different type of audience. Mm -hmm. Well yeah I mean it's not all that long ago. It might sound strange what I'm going to say, but this is a book that has remained in my mind since I read it. There's something very unique about it and very special. So to hear that it is being relaunched and it wasn't, I didn't know it wasn't available for those months. That's lovely. I'm trying to be briefer with listeners, as they may well know. Uh, so I'll give a very brief synopsis. The book is about a fairly famous disgraced celebrity and a fight to save a historic pavilion in the fictional town of Hooks Bay. And it's a pavilion which is wanted by a property developer due to it obscuring the sea view they want for their new apartment block. And this story was somewhat inspired by Oldley Tower in Leon Solent, I believe. Yes, it was, definitely. Um, I didn't know anything about the Oldley Tower. I mean, I grew up not that far from Farrah, not that far from Leon Solent. 
I remember going to Leon Solent to go to the old Lido as a child, but I have no recollection or knowledge of the Lee Tower complex. And it wasn't actually until I was living in the Netherlands and I came home to visit family and we were on a walk along Lee Seafront when I stopped to read a sign on the Esplanade. And it was a little bit, a little notice about the old Lee Tower where it stood on the, on the seafront. My imagination was well and truly captured. It's such a, an iconic building. It had a 120 foot high observation tower. It was an amazing shaped Art Deco building, triangular. And it must have been a very impressive sight there on the seafront. And to, to think that it's now just a car park and that nothing had been done to, to save the building. I'm, I'm, my imagination just ran riot. And I just thought, oh, there's a story. There's a story here. I can make up my own Art Deco pavilion, I can make up my own town and I can make a story about a entertainment complex that, you know, there is a fight by somebody who wants to preserve it and it will save this memorable building for prosperity and the, the idea was born. Well, you said about making your own fictional place, that's something I wondered, could you have set this book in a real place, do you think? Would it have worked for you? No, definitely not, because I think, like a lot of writers, we make up a little fictional sliver of a place that we know, so basically the South Hampshire coast, but if you create a fictional town, for instance, I invented this place called Hooks Bay, it doesn't have to be exactly the same as a real place. Somebody once commented who'd read The Theatre of Dreams, oh, but you don't mention the Hovercraft Museum, and it's like, wow, no, Hooks Bay doesn't have a Hovercraft Museum. Leon Solent does, but, you know, if I'd set it in Leon Solent, people would be saying, well, you haven't included this, you haven't mentioned that. There is no pavilion in, in Leon Solent. So it makes sense to actually just fictionalise a town. You can just do so much more with it than setting it in a real place. But I think it's quite nice to make references. I make references to Fareham, I make references to the Isle of Wight. So people know approximately the area that I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. No, I, I like those references. And you also... I forgot to uh, note this down in my notes, but you've reminded me. You've got Reading Room Lane, which I loved because I went there and went, oh, it's a perfect name for a lane, you know. Um, <laughs> so you, a couple of times, like, highlighting that. I love this, love this. Do you know what? I think there actually is a Reading Room, not in Leon Selly, but I'm sure I've seen a, a Reading Room Lane somewhere in Hampshire. I'm sure I've driven past it. I, I don't think subconsciously, you know, that I, I made up that name, but I, I don't remember seeing it. I think, oh, well, I must have driven past it, you know, in the past for it to... The stick in my mind that I used it. I think it's a lovely name for a road as well. Well, I can tell you that, yes, there is one. That's what I thought you were meaning. It's it's not oh. too far from here, from Southampton. Oh, there, is. there is yeah. really one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, slightly in the countryside. I'll see if I can find a photo or something so that the listeners can kind of get a what we're talking about. But you know, talking of Leon Solon, the tower was part of a, a sort of a resort or an idea of a resort and I read that there was going to be either a resort or it was going to become residential, and it became residential, Leon Solent. Do you think that was the right decision, knowing what you know? I don't know. It's in a funny position. I think with like um, having the, the Navy base so close, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would have worked as a resort. Fair enough. Shall we go to your reading? Because we've got a description of the pavilion there, I believe. Yes, yes, we have. Um, I'm just going to read a short passage, which is when Tara, my disgraced actress, has been lured down to Hooks Bay by Kitty Keaton, who is the owner of Hooks Bay Pavilion. And this is when uh, Kitty takes Tara to see the pavilion for the very first time. They've just met and had lunch in a pub. They're now taking the local Good Neighbours Scheme van to look at the pavilion. Where to now, your highness? The driver asked, opening the door with a bow. To my immense relief, we were his only passengers. The esplanade was flanked on one side by the beach, a scruffy bank of pebbles and shingle, which fell sharply into the sea, and on the other by a handful of beach-themed shops and fast food kiosks. Can you see it? Kitty cooed, a faint tremor of excitement clearly detectable in her voice. You mean the island? I asked. Across the slate grey water of the Solent, the Isle of Wight was impossible to miss. No, silly girl, the pavilion. Look beyond the park at the end of the esplanade. A low-rise white edifice sat isolated on the promenade, some distance from the central hub of Hooks Bay. A two-tier wedding cake, 
dumped on the seafront like an afterthought. Adjacent to the peculiar shaped building, jutting out across the shingle, barely reaching the low tide mark, were six rusty iron girders supporting the shortest pier I had ever seen. Art, beauty and culture. Hooks Bay Pavilion certainly needed an injection of something. That's the old hotel site, Kitty said as we approached the half demolished building on the other side of the Esplanade. According to Robbie, the road will divert inland and encircle the rear of the development. This area here will be pedestrianised. The council are very keen. There will be a cafe, some of those useless gift shops. You must know the sort of thing I mean. I certainly did. My friend B had an addiction to Yankee candles. Go on, get out, take a closer look. I had expected the pavilion to be a traditional seaside theatre with a domed roof and ornate Victorian gilding. My knowledge of architecture was appalling. Art Deco, Kitty had said, the era of flapper girls and the Charleston. And here it was, a small but perfectly formed slice of smooth, stylish South Beach, Miami, transposed to unfashionable Hooks Bay. Garish graffiti decorated the walls and tattered fly posters hung from the wood chip boards that protected the main entrance. Polystyrene food cartons, crushed beer cans and cigarette butts littered the marble steps. Pigeons and seagulls had colonised the flat roofs and the first floor balconies. The smell of decay was everywhere. I took my time walking around the building. At the rear, the entrance to the defunct pier was off limits behind an ugly chain fence. I completed my circuit and returned to the front of the building, where the imprint of a long lost sign was etched into the grubby concrete above the door like a tattoo. The pavilion nightclub and cocktail bar. No doubt the original would have been in flashing neon, complete with fluorescent pink flamingos and swaying tropical palms. I could quite see how the landscape of Hooks Bay might be improved by the removal of the derelict pier, but the pavilion had already captured my imagination. I took one last look before clambering back into the van and was almost blinded by the glare of late spring sunshine glinting like diamonds in the glass of the pavilion's curved atrium. Could this place really be transformed into Kitty's vision? There was no denying in that moment the shining pavilion shared its aura of vintage grandeur. So, Kitty said, a look of excited anticipation evident on her face. What do you think? Beautiful, isn't it? A little incongruous, but it's certainly got something, I admitted. It certainly has. She nodded her approval. So will you do it or not? Will you come to Hooks Bay and run my dance school? I didn't even hesitate before I answered. Good girl, she said, clutching my hand across the peeling faux lever of the van seats. The minute I saw you, I knew. We've been introduced to them. You have this wonderful elderly woman, Kitty, who is an absolute delight of a character and she's the owner of the pavilion. And then you've got Tara, the celebrity, whose drunken rant to a journalist sees her disgraced and in need of a new life. Got this lovely workings of the pavilion getting its new life and Tara at the same time. It's great. So Kitty finds out about Tara and invites her to take on the Arts Academy, as we have heard in your reading. Is either of these characters more important than the other? Oh, that's a difficult one. No, I don't think so. I think you couldn't have one without the other. Um, they come as a pair and the story is told mostly from Tara's point of view, but Kitty has a chapter every now and then. I think they bounce off each other. They're very similar in lots of ways and in other ways they're very, very different, but they're united by their, their love of performing arts and their desire to keep that alive in Hooks Bay. And You've got this wonderful, massive cast of characters. Was it difficult working with such a large cast of characters? No, I love characters. I mean, my my stories are always character driven. When I read about Lee Tower and I knew I could have a story there, it was character driven. The characters drive the plot forward. I mean, maybe, I mean, it has been mentioned that I do have too many characters in my books. The main characters, the trio of characters who work towards the restoration of the pavilion they all came to me very quickly very easily and the other people are the supporting cast the the original ballet teacher the, the elderly folk who form the conservation committee obviously the villain of the piece who is kitty's stepson and his wife and the property developer i enjoy creating characters that's the fun part for me i feel like a i'm like a puppet master and you're pulling the strings on all these people to make them do what you want them to do and then they take over which is quite frightening sometimes and then they just carry on with the story 
And very suited, really. As you've got the title Theatre of Dreams and everything. It did uh, occur to me sometimes that you have got quite a theatrical bent to it beyond the obvious, um, which was quite interesting to look at from a literary point of view. So you've got all these characters and Tara and Kitty. And I'm going to get into this bit. The thing that I I think I personally loved the most when I thought about what do I love most about this book? What is it that gets me? I think it's the fact that these characters are in the main very regular, very real people. They are people you'd see down the pub on a Friday night. And I noticed that you do use phrases, so you use middle class, upper class a few times. Was setting the book among so many working class people important for you? I think it's important to me that uh, readers can relate to my characters, can relate to my stories. I'm a great reader and I obviously love reading a wide variety of books, but I do like it when there is a character who I just empathise with, I know the situation they're in, I know their backgrounds are similar perhaps to mine. Although it's nice to read about, you know, people that live in grand houses and I can't always relate to them. They're, Mm. They're like a fantasy, a fantasy novel. Whereas it was important for me, and I have it in all my books, that my characters are normal people, if that makes sense. Hmm. Although obviously Tara's an actress, so she's not normal. And Kitty's uh, very eccentric, so she's not normal either. But the the setting, they're living in a normal house in a normal street, that brings people back down to earth. They go to the pub, they go shopping, you know, they go and buy groceries. You know, we can all relate to that. Mm -hmm. Well, you say about Tara's celebrity... Was there anyone that you drew inspiration from in terms of their fame or anything in writing her? Where does she fit in terms of theatre and and film and TV and stuff? Okay, so Tara is a musical theatre actress. So she would appear on stage. She's appeared in the West End. She would appear if you went to uh, Southampton Mayflower and watched the show. She could be in a show like that. She's not a household name. In Theatreland, she's well known. She's taken a starring role in some West End productions, but uh, she hasn't got a TV presence or a film presence, but she is well known in theatrical circles. I couldn't really give you a comparison because I'm not that up to date with who's who in the theatre at the moment. Her idol is Elaine Page, but Tara is nowhere near as famous as Elaine Page. But my oldest daughter actually went to perform in art school and she was doing the old singing, dancing, ballet dancing routines. So when she was a teenager, all this musical theatre was playing all the time in her room and things like that. So it was something that I knew a little bit about. Well, I was wondering, you know, what kind of research you did further than the the tower and things like that. And so... I suppose your your knowledge as a parent of someone going to the art school was able to influence what you wrote. Yeah, I think it definitely was. And also, initially, when Tara comes to Hooks Bay, uh, she thinks she's just taking over a dance school. That's that's how she's lured there to start with. So um, my daughter went to ballet classes in the village hall for years, and she actually is a qualified ballet teacher herself. So that part of it was very easy to write because I knew how that worked. I, I knew how the ballet schools worked. So yeah, that came to me quite easily and it was something that I knew about. Mm-hmm. So I would like to go back briefly to Leon Solent again. There's something that I'm wondering if you if you can answer. In your research and things, have we lost many buildings of the sort that you write about? Yes, yes, I did. I became quite obsessed with Art Deco buildings when I was researching this book. Obviously, the finest example is the De La War Pavilion at Bexhill. Um, I've actually never seen it in person, but I, I read about it and I've seen lots of gorgeous pictures of it. And this was very similar to my pavilion in Hicks Bay. And it was a seaside Art Deco pavilion, which was beautifully restored, was the subject of a public campaign and is actually now a gallery a live music venue I'd love to go and see it. it's a gorgeous building similarly there I think it's the Midland Hotel in Morecambe Bay private restoration it's a hotel now but I did actually get to see that a couple of years ago fantastic building and there is another one that is currently subject to a campaign to save it is actually in Belfast Zoo and it's called the Floral Hall 
it may have now, I mean, it's a few years since I was doing my research. Hopefully, maybe it's been restored now. You know, you walk along any seaside, any town on the coast that's got a pier, and there's going to be a pavilion of some description, whether it's Victorian or Art Deco. I mean, I'm assuming these buildings cost a fortune to run and maintain. So, yes, a lot of them have been lost. Well, have you ever been involved yourself in any sort of community project to save buildings or or anything else? You know, the community aspect of it? No, I haven't. I haven't. I have to, that sounds dreadful, doesn't it? I probably should. Uh, no, I haven't. I do support things online and I have an interest. I joined sort of like the peer association or something, I think. I am quite interested in local history, but I'm not actively involved in any campaigns. Well, I mean, you can't tell it from the book, you know, it does come across and there's a passion there that's further than Tara and Kitty. So I think we should probably talk about another aspect. We'll see how we go in terms of spoilers. You've got the mystery aspect and I love how it creeps up on you because this book just starts well and it continues to be a nice read and you know where you stand with it, the community, the pavilion and everything that's going on there. It's a good story in itself. And then comes the mystery of what happened to Jez. Was this always going to be part of the work from the start? Yes. Yes, definitely. I had Jez's story in my head before I actually read about the Lee Tower, to be honest. Ah. Yeah, funnily enough. I just needed something else to, to make his story complete. So he, he had his own story, but it wasn't enough. So to then discover about the Lee Tower and think, yes, we can have this restoration story. And then Jez becomes like a little subplot, although obviously it's all linked in because it becomes quite a significant part of the story. So are you saying that prior to the actual writing of it and prior to the inspiration from Lee Tower, was he part of the story in the flesh? Yeah, I I mean, as a writer, I've got lots of stories on my on my laptop. I've got lots of novels that have started and never finished, lots of ideas. So yes, I don't want to give a spoiler away, but his story was a separate idea for a, another novel. But there wasn't enough there. So it was then when I read about the Lee Tower and I was, thinking about the restoration and a novel about a restoration project and I realized that I could use Jez's story in the restoration project. Fascinating so was he a different person in this first plan? Oh yes yes (laughs) yes he was (laughs) yes he was yes yes different name different situation everything but what actually happens to him yes that that was the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was the kind of the takeaway or the biggest element you wanted to leave your readers with at the end oh um so many things really but I wanted to stress the importance of performing arts because it's something that I'm quite passionate about obviously with my daughter but I also feel it's part of the education system that doesn't have enough it's, it's not prioritized enough and, and it's so important because it gives people that perhaps aren't academic a chance to shine. And I think that's one of the themes that I wanted to come across. I also wanted to bring across how it's important to preserve our iconic buildings, our heritage, our cultural heritage, that these buildings have got so much history attached to them. So definitely that. I will say you just want the good guys to win. And Tara had been wronged and... Uh, it was good that she was able to overcome that and, and give something back and do something good. I just want readers to go away and at the end of the book think, oh, you know, that was such a good story. You know, I want them to be entertained, but I don't want to make it too easy, if that makes sense. I haven't heard that before. I like that. Yeah, entertained, but not too easy. I mean, you definitely do it. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we should talk about A Crisis at Cliff Tops, your latest novel. You found it difficult to get published because of the heroine's career. Yes, I mean, it's, it sounds incredible when publishers are crying out for diversity and the age we're living in the 21st century. But my main character, my heroine, is a professional golfer. And that seems to go against me. To be honest, I didn't submit it to a great many agents or publishers because in my mind I was thinking I was probably going to self-publish anyway just simply because I wanted to retain control over it Mm. but yeah I did have some rejections which basically said that a book about golf just wouldn't appeal wouldn't have commercial appeal which I felt was quite sad 
considering you know women in sport it's quite a big thing at the moment how women's sport is getting a lot a much higher profile but clearly not in the literary world but it's done okay it seems to have done all right there's some good reviews down there yeah yeah considering I self-published it I'm a one woman band and yeah I'm very pleased with it I'm really pleased with the way it's gone down I'm really pleased with the way that the heroine has been received and the comments I've had about her golfing just for anybody out there there isn't actually any hardly any golf in the story it's not a story about golf it's just that that's her job I could have made her do anything but I just thought no she's going to be a sportswoman well you've brought mystery into it as well so like theatre of dreams you've got the mystery aspect again yeah I'm calling crisis at clifftops a cosy mystery because the mystery is paramount to the story that is the main story a mystery so I wanted to try and break into the cosy crime cosy mystery genre mainly because I enjoyed the mystery element of A Theatre of Dreams and my second book they both got mysteries in them and I felt that was an area I liked writing the mystery elements of the books much more than the romance I mean I love a romance but to me the mystery was the route I wanted to go down. And book two is in production? Book two of Eliza K Mysteries The Crisis at Clifftops is in production and hopefully will be out next year. They're set in the Isle of Wight and I've realised there's an awful lot of history in the Isle of Wight and ideally I'd like my private amateur sleuth Eliza to start uncovering some vintage crimes that have never been sold. That's the plan anyway. So she could go on for years as long as people like her. We'll see how it goes but yeah I've got at least another two stories planned for her but like I say because I'm self-publishing I can work to my own time frame which is what I wanted to do. I just wanted to have the freedom to write what I wanted when I wanted. Brilliant. I think we'll wrap it up there. Rosie, it's been absolutely lovely having you and discussing a book that, you know, I've said it a few times now, something that has stayed in my head for a while and just everything about it, the relatability, the ease of the story, whilst, as you said, entertaining but working for it. It has been lovely. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much for hosting me. And I'm very glad that you love the book. And it's always lovely to hear from people who've read my books and to have some feedback. That's great. Thank you very much. Links to purchase The Theatre of Dreams and A Crisis at Clifftops are in the episode description. If you have enjoyed today's discussion, do subscribe or follow the podcast on your listening app of choice. It's totally free. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 48 was recorded on the 16th of September and published on the 25th of October 2021. Music and production by Charlie Place.